Federation of Trade Unions, the challenges of labor unrest, the challenge of labor unrest, and the challenge of transition, trade unions in Russia, China, and Vietnam. Katie Fox Hodes is a lecturer in work, employment, people, and organization at the University of Sheffield. Um, her research examines international solidarity among dock workers unions, and uh, she, having been a uh, PhD student at Berkeley, was really involved in political organization uh, and activism, both as a union member and as um, other, involved in lots of different forms of activism out in the Bay Area. Um, so what we're going to do today is, and I'm Lale Khalili, and I teach politics here. Uh, and part of what I'm working on right now is maritime transportation, uh, a, a fairly large project that is being wrapped up right around now. And so it has been a pleasure of mine to have these two lovely colleagues come and speak about one aspect of, obviously, maritime transport. Um, what we're going to do today is... Um, Tim and Katie are going to speak for a little bit, then uh, we're going to open the floor to a conversation between them and you guys and them, and uh, hopefully it'll be lovely and uh, interactive, especially given that um, it seems like everybody here has friendly faces. Um, okay, with that, I think Tim is going to, or Katie's going to go first. Great. Um, that'd be lovely. Um, Katie, please. Okay, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and I just apologize, I'm getting over a cold and have a bit of a cough, so hopefully it won't be too much of a distraction. Um, all right, so today I'm going to be talking about my research on dock worker trade unionism in global perspective. So over the course of four years, from 2012 to 2016, research for this project took me to 40 cities in 20 countries, in Europe, Latin America, and the United States, to interview key dock worker union activists and attend meetings of the International Dock Workers Council, a global union organization. The analysis focuses on five country case studies of recent dock worker disputes in England, Portugal, Greece, Colombia, and Chile, as well as including a cross-regional comparison of dock worker trade union internationalism in Europe and Latin America. I began the study by asking how can labor best organize at the transnational level to more effectively confront the challenge of globally organized capital. However, over the course of my research, it became clear to me that in order to answer this question, I would first need to rethink some of my assumptions about how worker power is constituted and the attendant implications for worker strategy. As the data I gathered continually challenged assumptions which are widely shared among many people in the labor movement, on the left more broadly, and in some academic traditions. The talk I'm giving today critically appraises those initial assumptions and proposes an alternative framework for thinking about worker power and strategy, particularly in relation to logistics workers. <coughs> so why study dock workers unions? to understand questions of worker power, strategy, and internationalism today. Logistics, of which dock work is a part, is an industry in its own right, providing the links in global supply chains that make globally disintegrated production and the geographical separation of production from major consumer markets possible. Within global supply chains, perhaps no single link provides greater disruptive potential than the ports. Ports today handle upwards of 90% of global trade. The global economy as we know it simply would not be possible without massive increases in maritime traffic. Consequently, there is a great deal of interest today in the disruptive power or potential power of workers in the global logistics industry. The logic uniting interest in the sector is that logistics workers provide a keyhole into the global economy as a whole. From the perspective of many labor movement practitioners and activists on the far left, as well as many scholars, organizing logistics workers may provide a sort of magic bullet for labor movement revitalization or more radical political projects, as disruptions at key choke points in the global economy send ripples outward. And yet, Edna Bonasich and Jake Wilson argue in their book, Getting the Goods, Ports, Labor, and the Logistics Revolution, 
that the logistics revolution has not resulted in uncomplicatedly positive outcomes for workers, as they're squeezed more and more by employers in the same just-in-time production processes that have necessitated the rise of logistics in the first place. In other words, logistics workers are not immune to the economic, social, or political changes depressing the collective power of workers more generally. Bonasich and Wilson's work, then, provides ample reason for skepticism about logistics worker organizing as a sort of magic bullet for labor movement revitalization. My own assumptions in this regard were challenged repeatedly as I conducted field work. In some cases in the dissertation, most notably in the successful Chilean and Portuguese cases, dock workers did in fact exercise an exceptional degree of power at the point of production, sending ripples outward and winning important victories. But the reasons that they were able to exercise power successfully had as much to do with particular sets of political and social circumstances in their countries as well as their embeddedness in broader networks and sound strategic decisions, as it did their position in the global economic system, which after all was equivalent to the position in the economic system of dock workers in the less successful cases in the project in England, Greece, and Colombia. This suggests that rather than assuming the power and reach of logistics workers a priori, it may be more useful to ask a different question. How is dock worker power constituted? And under what conditions can dock workers effectively exercise this power? This is the question that I'm addressing in this talk today. <coughs> so the dominant framework for understanding worker power today, particularly in sociology and geography, is the framework that was developed by Beverly Silver in her 2003 book, Forces of Labor, Worker Movements and Globalization Since 1877, uh, 1870. Uh, this book builds on an earlier article by Eric Olenwright. Following Olenwright, Silver divides worker power into structural power, rooted in the economy, and associational power, rooted in workers' collective organization in trade unions and political parties. Structural power is further divided into marketplace bargaining power and workplace bargaining power, which lies at the heart of Silver's analysis. Silver conceptualizes the impact of workplace bargaining power as a series of ever-widening circles of power emanating from the shop floor. As Silver puts it, the assembly line has allowed a relatively small number of strategically placed activists to disrupt the output of an entire plant. With the increasing integration of production among plants within a corporation, a strike in a plant producing a key input part could bring all downstream plants uh, and, and even an entire corporation to a standstill. Finally, with the increasing concentration and centralization of production, the disruption caused to a country's economy by a strike in a key corporation or key industry, including transportation industries linking plants to each other and to markets, also grew. This has been the case especially where workers are located in an industry on which a country overwhelmingly depends for foreign exchange. Workers in logistics are often cited as the key example of this as a result of their central nodal position in the global circulation of commodities, with perhaps no single group of logistics workers laboring in a more strategic location than the ports. Nevertheless, a long-term perspective on the port sector demonstrates that winning protections via state regulation as a consequence of labor struggles has been particularly critical to building the power of workers in this historically casualized industry despite the high degree of structural power that Silver's theory predicts dock workers should have. The deregulation of the industry, beginning in the 1970s and 1980s in the US and UK, conversely, has had a profoundly negative effect on workers' ability to exercise power on the docks. As Erik Helgesen, a dock worker leader at the port of Gothenburg in Sweden, put it, Employers in the state are just as aware of dock workers' strategic positions as dock worker trade unionists themselves are. 
As a result, dock workers are much more likely to be on the receiving end of state-led or state-sanctioned efforts to repress their power, whether through legal means, typical of the global north, or more overt forms of violence, typical of the global south. States, therefore, play a critical role in explaining variation in strategies and outcomes among workers who otherwise occupy similar positions in the global economic system, even or perhaps especially um, um, when these workers are particularly strategically situated, like dock workers. This suggests then that the strongest position for workers economically can simultaneously be the weakest position for workers politically with obvious consequences for their ability to successfully uh, exercise power in disputes. So while the strength of Silver's framework is its ability to explain broad sectoral level differences in worker power and strategy as a result of the different locations workers hold within the economy, I argue that her framework falls short in fully accounting for cross-national differences in power and strategy among workers who share a common position in the economic system in their respective countries. Um, in other words, her theory can't account for why dock workers in different parts of the world um, seemingly uh, actually have very different degrees of power. <clears throat> This framework, um, the alternative framework I propose brings the state back in while not neglecting the role of the economy in constituting worker power. This framework is better able to account for cross-national variation without sacrificing the ability to explain cross-sectoral variation. The framework I propose for understanding worker power and strategy as constituted through both economy and the state draws from the work of Antonio Gramsci and Nikos Poulantzis. Poulantzis argued that states are formed not merely in the realm of the economy, but through political, uh, excuse me, that classes are formed not purely in the realm of the economy, but through political and social determinations as well. I argue that what is true for class formation is also true for the constitution of class power. Because class struggle always plays out vis-a-vis -vis both employers and the state, as well as in civil society, worker power is always constituted economically, politically, and socially. Purely economic understandings are inherently ahistorical and unable to fully account for power differentials, particularly among workers located in the same position in the economic system in different parts of the world. The theoretical innovation of the study, then, is its analysis of the workplace as a political arena using analytical tools more generally employed to understand states or polities. Because worker power is not solely constituted by the economy, it follows that there is no one-size-fits-all model for successful labor struggle by workers in the same industry in different parts of the world. In order to be successful, worker strategy must instead be responsive to the particular conjuncture of state, economy, and society that, con that constitutes worker power in specific times and places. The argument on strategy then draws from Gramsci, who argued the need for divergent socialist strategy in the East and West because of the different relationship between state and society in each location. He proposed that it was only by understanding these national differences that revolutionaries could undertake a, quote, concrete analysis of the relations of force in order to reveal the points of least resistance at which the force of will can be most fru fruitfully applied. These insights are relevant for understanding worker strategy, both cross-nationally and cross-regionally, given the continued differentiation of political economy at the national level in the global capitalist system. Such a framework provides a stronger foundation not only for analyzing appropriate strategy for given national contexts, but also crucially provides a stronger foundation for workers to assess the possibilities for building trade union organizations across borders. Given the centrality of the state in constituting dock workers' structural power, any understanding of their power in the global context will necessarily require an understanding of the ways in which states are differentiated and related to one another in the global system. Despite the limitations of the term, imperialism 
broadly construed to signify both the economic and political domination of peripheral states by regional and global hegemons through the vast array of forces at the hegemonic state's disposal must form a central part of the analysis. The position of states within the global political economy, as well as the relations between them, shape both the ability of workers in a given country to make use of their position in the economic system, as well as shaping the terrain upon which workers within different states may form relations with one another across borders. In this study, then, I consider a core region, Europe, and a peripheral region, Latin America. Fundamentally, at the regional level, I argue that Latin America provides a sharp contrast to Europe in terms of the ability of dock workers to make use of their power at the point of production. In Europe, the dock workers' unions in general are on the defensive, overt violence against trade unions, either sponsored or sanctioned by the state, is rare. And the legacy of earlier and more robust periods of working class organization and struggle remain embedded in industrial relations systems that compare favorably to those uh, available to workers in most of the rest of the world. As a consequence, though European dock workers struggle against capital on a less propitious playing field than in the past, this playing field nevertheless allows them substantially greater room to maneuver than that available to workers in much of the global south, including Latin America, because social and political factors in the broader society continue to allow them to exercise substantial power at the point of production. This has proved advantageous not only for dock worker trade union struggles at the national level, but also for the growth of trade union internationalism within Europe. Um, these differences with Latin America and the global south more generally are ultimately attributable to the ongoing legacy of northern imperialism. To conclude, I'll now return to the question posed earlier of the conditions under which dock worker unions are able to successfully exercise their power. I found that dock worker unions met with success under two conditions. The first condition was that they and their international allies be able to engage in industrial action at the point of production without being crushed by state-sanctioned violence and legal repression. This condition is largely met by most dock worker unions in the global north, with far few, fewer unions in the global south meeting this condition. The highly constrained context faced by dock workers in the Colombian case in my study where workers were unable to effectively exercise power at the point of production as a result of state-sanctioned violence and the absence of labor law enforcement, more closely approximates the conditions faced by dock workers and workers more generally in most of the world than the conditions uh, of workers in Europe. Global unionism must learn to better contend with this reality. Second, dock workers met with success when conditions in the broader society allow them to form alliances with other organized groups and make credible claims that their struggles were in the interest of a broader public. In other words, I found that it was often the flank of non-strategic workers that protected the fortress of strategic dock workers during conflicts, rather than the other way around. Strategically located workers, such as dock workers, who become politically and socially isolated, lose power over time. In fact, both the trade unions in the successful cases in my study in Chile and, and Portugal, though relying primarily on the exercise of power at the point of production, made extensive use of domestic alliances to bolster their claims in the broader society and polity. And research participants viewed these alliances as critical to their success. Once the socio-political determinants of workers' structural power are met, an additional set of conditions concerning the exercise of worker agency determine success or failure in given cases. While sociopolitical conditions determine the, the ab ability of workers to exercise power at the point of production, as well as the availability of potential external alliances, ultimately exercising power in these ways, whether on the shop floor or outside of the workplace, depended on the strategic decisions of union activists themselves. In this regard, I found that union democracy, defined here as the ability of rank and file workers to exercise a central role in strategic decision making, 
appeared as a necessary precondition for shop floor militancy and the construction of fruitful external alliances and the successful Chilean and Portuguese cases. Bureaucratized trade union organizations, conversely, were less likely to meet with success as competing organizations. <laughs> I see we have some UCU members in the room. <laughs> Bureaucratized trade union organizations, conversely, were less likely to meet with success as competing organizational objectives took precedence over shop floor issues, hindering the development of an effective shop floor strategy. Overall, the cases suggest that successful global unionism requires organizational flexibility and responsiveness to the wide array of national contexts in which workers, workers struggle, rather than a one-size-fits-all model. In practice, this means not assuming workers' structural power a priori, on the basis of their economic position, but instead remaining attentive to the constraints and possibilities of a given national context for worker organizing. For dock workers specifically, this requires recognizing that while their greatest power ultimately stems from their ability to stop the flow of commodities in the global economy, this form of power will not always be available to them in practice as a result of national uh, social and political factors. And whether or not it is available, extra workplace alliances and sound strategic decisions during disputes remain determinative of success. Thank you very much. Do you like to sing? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We have to press the button for the display again. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks, Katie. That was really interesting. And as I hope we'll see, I've kind of, can you hear me without the mic? I'm trying to wander around a bit. Um, maybe, I should, maybe I should stop that, yeah. Um, um, uh, it tends, it, you know, hopefully uh, what I will do is, is kind of drill down a little bit more at the national, at the constraints and possibilities, to use yours words, of a given national context. This is a national context that is profoundly difficult, an authoritarian state uh, in which the traditions of, traditions of working class militancy have been very much uh, been uh, subsumed by state power authoritarian control. So I've called this really taming labor because I touch on the, uh, or draw on rather, the association, structural and associational power that, that form the, the, the theoretical basis for some of, or, or for the introduction of, of Katie's talk. Um, and, and, I, and I look at how, how that, uh, the results that that brings in a situation where workers have significant structural power, but where associational power is entirely denied, really. So, and, and in doing that, I speak to some of the debates around uh, the labor movement in China, or the emerging labor movement in China, the issue of trade union reform in China, and the issue of, of, of power and regime stability within, within that country. So, in simplistic terms, the paper, the paper itself, by the way, is in International Labor, the International Labor Relations Review, is on the online first bit online now, and it will be out in print later this year. Um, in, in, and, and really at its most basic term, the question I'm asking is, is that does the absence of freedom of association, because freedom of association doesn't exist in China, so uh, does that absence, and nor does protection of the right to strike, does this exclude the possibility of a functioning trade union. So in many ways, what we've seen in China over the last decade in, in particular is a significant improvement of paying conditions across, uh, differentiated across the country and by, uh, in, in different political economies that exist in China, but we've seen a significant improvement that I will argue, and have argued in, in various publications, is driven primarily by working class militancy. So, but where, how does that happen? How can that happen in a country, or in a, in a context rather, where freedom of association is entirely, is entirely denied? And, and indeed, just the act of four or five years ago, because the time has changed the situation, or the, the, the face of authoritarianism, the shade of authoritarianism in China over the last five years, but four or five years ago, I could have given this talk in China. I would not now, because it would, uh, you know, the place would be full of, full of people who you really wouldn't want to be there, really. So, but my question is, is, is really about, in this context, in this very different, difficult context, can, can uh, existing, can, can an enterprise level trade union 
function. So how do I measure that functionality? Or how, how, how can we measure this functionality? Well, I've, I've used three very, again, very simple, very basic trade union uh, inst in instruments or, or yeah, benchmarks, really. One is accountability, the, the kind of union democracy that Katie talked about, and which most Chinese workers still could never dream of. Or they'd probably dream of it, but could certainly not, not achieve under current conditions. The other is the notion of institutionalized collective bargaining, something that we take for granted in, in, in many, many states around the world, but in, in China simply does not exist, but is beginning to emerge. And thirdly is, is, is material gains for workers as well. So those are the three ways in which I measure it. So the context, what is it, what, uh, that measure that idea of a, of a functioning trade union? So, so the context here. So to drill down a little bit more about what I mean. The All-China Federation of Trade Unions in China is a party-led trade union. Constitutionally, it, it, is, it, it, it operates under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. In, in trade union law, Article 10 of China's trade union law specifically states that you cannot organize a trade union outside the ACFTU. Now, because of the ACFTU's constitutional and legal acceptance of leadership of, 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 of the state, really, of the party there, um, when, the t when the interests of its own members clash with those of what I would refer to as the ruling class in China, then, of course, the ruling class takes precedence. Now, this actually, although we, I, I'm looking at the Chinese context, I think that the differences, as a little tangential observation here, the differences between the a or, 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 or a party-led All-China Trade Federation of Trade Unions and, indeed, apparently independent trade unions, um, I don't believe is as great as, as, as is often, often, often commented on, certainly in, 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 Western, in the Western bourgeois press. But nevertheless, in, the, in, in, in China itself, this, this party-led union is, is, as Eli Friedman called them, is, is as uh, Friedman has referred to, is a suffocating straitjacket on working class activity, on working class militancy. This organization, the ACFDU, is politically strong because of its links to the, the, the ruling class, the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party, uh, but is organizationally very, very weak. So at city level, it, 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 can, it, can, it, it can throw its weight around, it can discipline enterprises or, or, or capitalists when, when it feels necessary in order to maintain a balance of, of class forces to, to facilitate capital accumulation and, and regime stability. But in the workplace itself, it's generally very, very weak. Um, uh, the, the, the in, in China, Chinese workers have a, a, a well-known saying, which is, uh, whatever the boss says goes, which means that, and that includes trade union. And indeed, the trade union rep in many Chinese workplaces or the chairperson of the, of the enterprise level branch is often the personnel manager in the enterprise itself <laughs> as well. So you can, uh, it's a bit like here, I don't know how many people from the South are here, so it'd be, be a bit like, um, instead of Tom Armstrong being the UCU chair or, or general secretary, it would be Richard Black, right, you know, which is... <laughs> Kind of maybe, anyway, won't go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that refers to my previous point about the differences between party-led trade unions and so-called independent trade unions. Um, but to move on quickly, uh, so the, the, the dominant context, a dominant discussion around the notion of, of the second level of measuring functionality of an enterprise-level trade union is, is this notion of, co of collective negotiation. Now, in China, there is an emerging debate around, certainly up until 2016, where clampdown, where there was a, 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 a quite a widespread clampdown on, on those of us who were engaged in, the, in that debate. There is a debate around collective consultation and the notion of collective bargaining. Now, I'm perfectly willing to accept that collective bargaining is, by its nature, is not a revolutionary device. I'm not laboring under any illusions that collective it's a, it's a it's an instrument of class compromise, which we hope, by our own uh, militancy, by our own collective strength, we can force concessions out of the capitalist class. Collective consultation, as I'll explain later on, is something very different. It's a different notion and, uh, entirely. Another context around the notion of structural power of workers is the generalized labor shortages and high labor turnover, which I'll come back to in, in the methodology in, in, in a second. And then we have, since about 2004 and the onset of those labor shortages, we have seen a significant uh, rise in levels of, of working class militancy. Now, figures on strike days, strike days lost in China, don't exist. In fact, well, they do exist. It's just that the police have them and they won't give them to anybody <laughs> else. Right? And it, indeed, it's pro prohibited legally uh, to, to publish any, any, co any 
national level statistics on, on strikes. Nevertheless, uh, well-known labor NGOs, well-funded labor NGOs, and also academics such as Manfred Elstrom have, have conducted their own kind of social media-based uh, um, loosely representative statistics on, on strikes. I haven't included the timetable, but, th but, but the literature uh, is acknowledges, you know, almost everybody acknowledges that there is a, a significant rise, not just in labor protests, because that was something that really characterized um, capital accumulation in China in, in the 1990s, but also of strikes themselves. And I think there is a significant difference between the two, because what we're talking about, the dot workers that I studied or we studied in Yantian in South China, what they were doing was bringing a halt to that process of accumulation, which labor process, hitherto labor protests in China, up until about 2005 didn't. Um, and then we've seen the state worrying because of its anxieties about the, 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 the extreme uh, inequalities that the model of development that it had generated was beginning to generate, it, what was, be, was, was generating, was beginning to shift, certainly between, I'd say, from 2002 to around, I've written 2012, 2013 there, but you could probably extend that to around 2014 to a a concession, uh, a shift from repression to concession when, when confronted with increasing strikes. Strikes were being normalized. Now, the absence of, uh, the, the, the presence of concession, of course, does not exclude the, the, the fear of repression and indeed the reality of repression. I'm not arguing for one second that that didn't exist in this time period. Nevertheless, if you look, if you look at the, the rise in average wages, if you look at the rise in minimum wages, if you look at the rise in, in the number of strikes, and if you look at the former and um, uh, organizing strategies of those strikes, which we'll, explain, uh, which we'll see in a minute, you can see a definite shift. Re repression wasn't the only player in the game. Location, where do I, so where do I test this context? Where do I put this context into play? Where did we go? We went to the Yentian International Port Terminal. It's a huge terminal. It's grown exponentially uh, to the, uh, in the way the logistics sector, as Katie described, has, has internationally anyway. And, and we're looking at, I forget, the, the, I, I think we're looking at, it's gone from number nine as the, as the most important port in the world or the most bu busiest port in the world to number one or two over the last 10, 10 or 12 years. The growth was really significant. It's a high-tech port. It's, highly o it's high capital investment. It's a joint venture run by the uh, Hong Kong Wampoa Company uh, and also a, a, a Chinese, uh, a Chinese uh, state-owned, a former Chinese state-owned enterprise um, outfit. It's a key node, and this speaks to, the, to, the, to those uh, uh, points of structural power that Katie referred to on to uh, a bit before. It's a keynote in an export of consumer goods to the markets of, of both of the states, Japan, and indeed uh, around, around the world. So if the, if, if the context is rising working class militancy, if we, if we look at this militancy in a particular port and see if we can, we can judge that militancy, see what it, what, could, what, can, what it can emerge in terms of organizational outcomes, then we need to look at, I, I would argue, uh, as Katie did, to start, start with the, the sources of workers' power, not least structural power and associational power. Now, Katie's uh, already described uh, and explained uh, how uh, Silver builds on Eric Olin Wright's paperwork in 2000 to look at different types of market, marketplace bargaining power and workplace bargaining power. I'm going to talk about how the, how, how the Shenzhen, that's a, a powerful city-level trade union in South China, nearest to the port, how that used its own awareness of the potential for independent so associational power to emerge to tame the forces of labor, to tame, to tame that power, to use, to use um, forces of labor, to use Beverly, Beverly's terminology. In doing that, um, I, 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 what, what I hope is a theoretical or loosely, loosely a theoretical contribution to the literature, that instead of taking these concepts of power as, as, as static, concepts that, that therefore you have, and this I suppose this links to what Katie is arguing as well, that you have to look at national conditions or, or, or a con the co national context. Um, I don't see these, these, these ex associations of power and structural power, forms of structural power, as, as, as static concepts, as a way to think that says this is a, it's, it, it, what I'm trying to do is present a, dialect, a dialectical extension of Bright and Silver. So in, in doing that, to use a classic Marxist uh, approach really, is that you know, the, the synthesis here is that effective workplace trade unionism, i.e. associational power, is excluded by party-led trade unionism and a formal absence of freedom of association. 
But if we look at its antithesis, the powerful strikes, an expression of structural power, is forcing those party-led unions to experiment with effective workplace trade unions, some trade unionism, something that most of, most of the literature would, would, would argue is not, is, it does, cannot exist in China, theoretically cannot exist in China. And, and out of that, I'm going to argue that the forces of labor are tamed into a specific variation of associational power that re leaves room for effective workplace trade unionism. Now, effective in, in, in qualified terms, really, just as tra especially trade unionism in any context is qualified by the forces of capital and the state, as the case is said. Why did I choose, why did we choose YICT? Well, for two reasons, really. One is because it, it, it brought together, it allowed us to put under the microscope two key characteristics that I've already explained of China's labor relations system. One is that we're seeing a, an extension or expansion of growing working class power. And the other is the notion of trade union reform, that the ACFTU, from being a party-led beast, can in fact be manipulated or forced into making some concessions to, to, to behaving a little bit like a, like a trade union that is responsive to its members. Um, is, 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 so it contributes to the debates around that. And that has been a very fierce debate in the literature and among workers themselves over the last decade in, in China. The timescale I use is important. It's from 2007 to 2013. Why is that important? Because this was the height of labor shortages. It was the height of that wave of working class militancy that possibly reached its first nadir in 2010 with a, with a famous uh, wave of strikes across the auto sector in China, but, but also uh, carried on well, it, well up into 2014, 2015. Um, also, what, is, what makes YICT a little bit different, because I talked about high labor turnover being a distinguishing feature of, of labor relations in China, is so that YICT, at the, NTN, at the NTN International Container Terminal, is that we had a low labor turnover, and that many of the workers involved in the 2007 strike were also there and remembered and took part in the 2013 strike as well. So what we're seeing is, is a... It's a uh, Brought, the, the method is based on the fact that we can bring characteristics that are, are there in the literature and are there in other studies, but also um, a, a bit of an outlier as well. Outlier as well in that there is a high labor, there is a low labor turnover here. The argument I'm going to make, or, or make to summarize what I've said already, is that the local city level trade union, now that is where political power is in the Chinese trade union system. It's not at the enterprise level, it's at the city level, probably sounds familiar. Um, uh, the, the, is the Shen, was the Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions. And, and, and what, the, what led, led by a particularly, I would say, class conscious and very savvy, savvy individual or, or deputy chair called um, uh, 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 Mr. Wang uh, that, that, uh, that recognized that the significant structural power possessed by the gantry and tower crane operators at, at the YICT in particular had the potential to generate alternative forms of associational power. I had the power to generate a union, that, or a, a, I wouldn't say a union, but a, a, a form of associational power that was not under the control of the ACFTU. And because of the ability, and I'm not making those assumptions that Katie is warned us of, which I entirely agree, agree with, that, that we should uh, uh, immediately associate, oh, dot workers, they are very powerful, they, they can, you know, a bit like we used to think about miners in the UK, you know, like Thatcher thought we can beat the miners, you can beat anybody. Unfortunately, it proved to be right until the UCU's great strike the other month. Um, but, uh, but, 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 but I, I think what, what this, what by, by, by locating the, or bringing this argument, testing this argument out in China, I think I'm going away, or we're trying to go away from the from the default reaction that dot workers are always powerful. And certainly not, it is not the case in China because, as Katie says, of the role of the state and the authoritarian context in which we're looking at here. So the associational power that is inherent, that is, there is a possibility there, is tamed, is restricted to economic demands. Is, 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 uh, and out of this, institutionalized collective bargaining is, is, is established. Now, again, we'll go into the detail in a minute, but I'm not arguing that collective bargaining is always a good or is, you know, is the kind of holy grail of, of, of trade unionism. But nevertheless, certainly in these conditions, the institutionalizing of annual collective bargaining was, did, did generate positive gains for, for workers. This is based on, on uh, negative collective bargaining, a rights version of ne rights interpretation of negative collective bargaining based on, mutual, based on mutual concessions. And this is crucial, again, again, of drawing a, 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 
on, on that Gramsci notion in which the coercion is continually the, is, is not continually deployed actively to control people's actions, but nevertheless, as you will see, is always present. She's always there in the background, really. So to go back to, to the types of collective negotiation that I talked about earlier, that I me mentioned earlier on. In China, collective bargaining doesn't exist in law. It's very rarely, it's very rarely mentioned in law. Um, uh, instead, you have this instrument or this device co concept called collective consultation. This, this collective consultation imagines a rather abstract notion of, of consensual negotiations by equal partners in which there is no, in which everybody operates on an equal, equal basis. What it tends to do in practice is it reproduces or even undermines labor law standards that have been set, set by, by the national labor law. So you can have a situation where a collective negotiation can produce an agreement because workers have no part in this, this process whatsoever, an agreement that produces standards that are lower than trade union law, uh, than, than labor law st standards themselves. So it's no surprise that levels of collective contracts in China, 54% in 2011, are very high because generally they don't mean anything. They're completely vacuous statements. Workers aren't involved in their, in their, in, in, in their negotiation. They're usually done, uh, they're, they're very much a management tool and they're given a rubber stamp by a, a, power, a, a very weak trade union that is not interested. Because of that rise of working class militancy, we're seeing, we're seeing instead, we're seeing other forms of bargaining driven by, driven by militancy that are emerging alongside collective consultation. We're seeing sector level bargaining, i.e. Uh, uh, sectors uh, uh, such as the shirt making sector, usually specific to local districts. We've seen some quite interesting work around there. We've seen bargaining emerged in the Northeast, in the Dalian uh, special economic zone up there where, where working class militancy has pushed otherwise very passive officials, including trade union officials, into, into some, some form of, of collective negotiation that, that, that is a little different uh, than collective consultation. Most interestingly, in Guangdong province in the south, linked to industrial upgrading and a general change in the political economy of Guangdong, we've seen a, a much more active and agency-based closure bargaining. So when capital relocates, Workers will then protest, will say that we want our, we want, we want our, our share of compensation in accordance with the state's laws. And, and this tends to involve a lot more, uh, uh, usually a direct strike, uh, it usually involves that negotiation is, is part of the strike and, uh, and often the involvement of other non-state non actors such as, such as labor NGOs. I call this closure bargaining because it tends to come in stations where capital is relocating. So capital has, has, or the state has not a lot to lose. It will generally allow this to, 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 to go ahead. Not always, but generally. And then we have annual collective bargaining. And to this, this, I would argue, is a significant breakthrough in an expression of both structural and association in power in China. Because it's an institutional, institutionalization of a certain amount of, uh, of, of, of bargaining based on what the threat of, uh, based on strikes or the threat of strikes. So as I said, the drivers of this are working class militancy, concerns over state concerns over growing inequality from the development model, the rise and subsequent fall, I'm afraid of play, say, of non-state actors such as labor, NGOs, and also concerns generally that we've seen particularly under, under the last five years under Xi Jinping of, of party legitimacy and regime stability in general. So that's, that's driven the kind of exploit experimentation we've seen around as a result of, of that militancy. So on the waterfront it, itself, the first strike that we looked at um, was way back in 2007. I couldn't get to the scene, unfortunately, because, because it, was, it, was a, it, was too, it was it was too sensitive for a, for a non-Chinese to be there, but we had research teams down there, and, and what we saw then was a, a wave of strikes across ports in China, across South in Guangdong province, uh, that uh, that culminated in this uh, powerful and immediately effective strike of 280 crane operators at YICT, uh, the NTN container terminal, that 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 made this extraordinary pay rise uh, demand of 5,000 5, yuan, uh, which at the time, and these were workers, these are, these crane operators, they're not, they weren't the kind of um, high uh, uh, um, in, 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 in both in the, in the media and in some academia, Chinese workers are generally presented as, as passive, as, as inability to fight, 
super exploitation, that they will take low wages, et cetera, et cetera, these kind of very, very uh, passive um, uh, representations. These, I would argue that that representation is, is entirely false, but these guys were not part of that representation. They were paid at least six, or paid three or four times, or three times the minimum wage for the, for the area. And, and also, although they were migrant workers, many of them had sunk roots in the area. And they based their 5,000 yuan wage increase demand on the, 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 the rate that the port had grown over the last nine to ten, uh, ten uh, eight or nine to ten, year, ten years. And he also demanded, they wanted elected trade union representatives uh, uh, that were paid for directly out of their own, own, own wages. At the time, there was no trade union, not even an official trade union uh, at, at, the, at the company and also at the dock, and they also wanted a paid lunch break. The effect of this strike was almost immediate. Within, within three or four hours, I think there were 15, 15 ships built up in, 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 in the local bay, and within 24 hours, there were well over 100. It terrified the bejesus out of both the, the company and also the, the local ruling class as well, particularly, and its agency in the trade union, which was the Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions, who immediately rushed down to the scene. It was, it was very angry, it was, it was, it was, pan, it was chaotic, and, and it's, at, at this time, we, we begin to see, because of the threat that this, this scene had, the, the threat to, as, as I said in the early side, the threat to both party legitimacy and regime stability that this kind of action provided on the top of, of, of a general build-up in working class militancy is that the union moved from its traditional role of either mediating or, 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 or encouraging workers to go back to work, to immediately get people back to work. Instead, they, they focus on some of the key demands of the workers as, as, as well. The 3% wage increase um, doesn't match the 5,000 yuan, but, but that, uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was a strategic, a tactical demand anyway. 3% of the 7,000 yuan a month that the, people, that the dockers were earning was, was a significant wage increase. They also won a, uh, a 500 pound per month a height subsidy, return to work, uh, height subsidy that they've been arguing. Uh, uh, lunch hours were paid. There would be no gratuities and no scapegoating, and there, were, there was no scapegoating of activists. And also that the, the union, so the, the one of the key demands was that unions had their own reps and they paid for those reps. That was a way to try and bypass the, the mo mo monopolistic nature of the All China Federation of Trade Unions. The Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions said that is not on, you can't do that, that's against the law, we will not accept that. But nevertheless, the, and, and this is where the taming began, they did organize a set of uh, responses to those demands so that workers' reps were elected. Uh, and we'll look at that process in a minute. So how did that happen? So this taming, so taming, taming of the asso uh, a potential associational power that was beginning to emerge uh, around the docks in Guangdong province at, province at the time, not just at Yantian, was 12 full-time officials were seconded to the, to, to, to the Yantian port. So that, that, that is, you know, this is a union that is stretched for resources. The Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions is stretched for resources. So sending 12 full-time officials down there was a huge, was, you know, is, is, I, I think is, is a, there are only 2,000 people working there. So it's, 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 a, it's a, 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 a testament to how, how, how worried they were. There was an extensive consultation where these union officials and other activists actually talked to workers, actually asked them how they felt about the strike, how they felt about the working conditions, what were their key key complaints, uh, what were their key, key, key demands moving on from the strike itself. There was an election of a, a really interesting guy who I'd call uh, W. Sai Q for his own, own safety and also five full-time union officials paid for by the enterprise. These elections were indirect, in other words, they weren't direct electors like, like, like the, the new house. Um, uh, they were by, by shop, and so you would elect a, a, a representative in a certain shop on the port. If you were a crane operator, a uh, certain part of the geographical area of the port or lo location of the port would, would elect a rep, and they were then uh, directly a, a, a trade union committee. Tim, excuse me, just stay behind the oh, thing. Sorry, so yeah. That, yeah, the sorry, yeah. Th and otherwise, it won't be recorded. On oh, OK, yeah. And, and also bargaining teams were elected separately. This was quite an interesting innovation in that the problem with trade union committees, as we all know, as a member of a trade union committee, I'm probably guilty of this, that there is a separation between, between rank and file and workers. The bargaining teams themselves for the annual bargaining that the Shenzhen Federation and trade unions force the, the, uh, uh, force, force the, 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 uh, the dock owners to concede to were elected separately. 
And this actually gave uh, uh, WZNQ more room to manoeuvre in how he approached the, 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 the annual collective bargaining, the annual negotiation. And he was able to, to demonstrate, and, and this, you know, it sounds pretty lame here now, but the idea of a trade union rep in China saying we won't be too hard in words, but we'll show our power in practice to an employee in the context of authority in China is really quite, it's, it's, it's quite new. It's, it is, it is a, a, a testament to, I think, both the extent of structural power that the work, dock workers had and the fear that they, they had inspired with their, with their strike group. It wasn't a static thing either. As negotiations, uh, as these annual negotiations carried on uh, up from 2008 onwards, they generated 8 to 10% annual pay increases. But there again, which were fairly significant, but there again, they were also, those pay increases were, um, were, were negated to a certain extent by other state policies, such as local state policies, such as the introduction of housing providence schemes or housing with pair schemes, basically, and, and a nine-grade productivity system at the, at the, at the port that the, uh, that the, uh, the um, port operators insisted on, on employing. is significant pay increases out of annual, annual uh, the collective bargaining, but nevertheless, there was a, it, it wasn't as static. It had moved beyond that kind of static notion of every year we do this. There were threats of strikes each year. There were, there were changes in the, in the makeup of the, of the bargaining team. And, and it was a, a very fluid situation. So fluid to the fact that the, the union, the, the, uh, I haven't included it in the paper, but we also interviewed, we managed to get an interview with the, with the managing director of, of, of the NTN. And, and, and he made it very clear um, reflecting the words of, of, the, of the union rep here as well, that they were very frightened of future strike action and their main, their main, their, their main aim during the negotiations was to, was to avoid a repeat of, the, of, the, of, of, of another strike. It didn't work because I think because of state strategies around uh, housing provident and, and, and the, the company's provident, uh, uh, productivity, productivity pay scheme, Another strike broke out just before annual collective bargaining in 2013. And again, this, this was not just crane operators this time, it spread very quickly to the rest of the port. It had a, a, a demanded a 2,000 yuan pay increase and, the, why, and it, showed them, it showed really the limits of this new trade union, that, that were the limits of its functionality. But I would argue the mere fact that workers were able to, to despite the fact that their power was being tamed by this union, that they still felt they were able to draw on that power to, structural power to, to try and stop capital and, and, and put their demands, is really, you know, is a sign of a functioning, of a functioning labor relations system, which is certainly not revolutionary, but is, 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 is very important in the context of China. And indeed, it achieved a second strike, achieved a, an extraordinary 30% pay rise, achieved a, a plus of 5,000 yuan back to work bonus. So, and again, I'm not talking about uh, super exploited workers. I mean, it, it's shit work working in the cranes. It's, it's very hard. It's, it, it does, it, it, it's a very difficult job, but it's, it's not the same as working 14, 15 hours a day on an assembly line, as you see in the zones in China and, and other special economic zones. It's, it, it's better paid. So in some ways, this is, this is, you know, it's not a wild comparison to say that our strike in the UCU that can you imagine that they paid us to go back to work after the <laughs> pension strike? It's, you know, we're talking about very different sectors, but similar amounts of, of, of clout, really, of similar amounts of, of clout, really, I think. Um, it also came with, the settlement also came with a warning from the Shenzhen Federation of Trade Union, which really showed the limits of this taming, where they would move, that the, the move from concession, from repression to concession in that narrative that had become very powerful, that had become very dominant in China for, for a, a brief period, that, that these guys had, had reached its limit. And the Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions was very clear in saying to the strikers that if this carries on, if this level of militancy carries on, um, uh, then we, we are no longer in control of events, i.e. there is a threat of repression, that the arm of coercion would be deployed. So, so I, I, would, sorry, I, I would argue that this... Um, that this scenario, that these events, these two strikes and the annual collective bargaining that happened uh, in between them really uh, uh, make, uh, are important for our understanding both of changing labor relations in China and understanding the notion and, 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 and the situation, the, 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 the nature of, of militancy in, in the country.
First, I would argue that unlike uh, my friend and comrade Eli Friedman, Eli has argued in his book, uh, 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 Trap uh, 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 on Insurgency in China, or Labor Insurgency in China, that a functioning trade union is not possible in China because of the fact that trade union, because the, the state or the, the union will always adopt the low-hanging fruit that militant workers have themselves created. What we found, and that, that, that's what Eli, Eli found in his own research, what we found was, this, was a different scenario. And I think this scenario is very, very important for understanding the notions of, of structural power and associational power in China. Earlier work in China had also noted that many strikes will be followed by the exit of activists, the exit of either to labor NGOs or the exit of, of strike organizers or, or them being sacked. This, again, this didn't happen at Yen Tian, and that many of the strikes was in 2007 were still there in 2013. So, again, not to romanticize about the, 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 the kind of historical narratives of dot workers' cohesiveness and, and solidarity, et cetera. But nevertheless, this was, this, this was an important departure from existing strike patterns and forms of organizing. Further, that even though that many workers there and the workers we interviewed were very aware of what the Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions was doing to tame their own enterprise level union, well, and, and you can see from this quote, um, they were aware of what they doing. There was a kind of grudging acceptance that it was better than nothing. And I think that's a key, it sounds like a very minor point, but I think it's a key point. Is something like this, which we can see the limitations of, i.e. Of, of this kind of very qualified expression of working class associational power, is it better than nothing? So uh, one, one, one guy we are argued said, uh, yes, our solidarity has improved significantly. From January to October, when collective bargaining begins, almost all workers discuss trade union and collective consultation without any prompting, i.e. collective bargaining. He's still using that term, uh, the, the, the term. In the past, we only grumbled to each other. We have all changed a lot. So, and I think the second, the second uh, aspect that this, this, this research ma certainly makes, I, I think, uh, begs us to think about is really is a, is a relationship between structural and associational power and that these are dynamic and not sta static ca uh, categories, that there is a, a, a tension there and that this tension was manifested by the, by the appearance of, of, of annual collective bargaining, both its limitations and, its, uh, and, its, and the positive nature and those wage rises that it, that it, that it achieved. But we see that the armor of coercion is never far away, it's present, but generally was not deployed, but, but there was a threat of it being deployed, certainly in the second strike as well. That management concessions to main, maintain production are, are achievable, even in a very difficult envi organizing environment, such as we found at Yen Tian. And that the, the main reason that the Shenzhen Federation of Trade Unions adopted this kind of innovative approach was, goes back to the, the to, to Really, it's not really a departure from why it exists anyway, which is to guarantee regime stability and to serve the interests of the party. It's not really a departure from that, but it's an ad adaptation of that very strict straitjacket, as Eli calls it, as, and others have called it, of, of worker or, or official worker organizing in, in China. I think, too, is that workers, uh, uh, well, we've talked about that, that this association of power is tamed. And is it better than nothing? Which takes us back to the union reform debate. And I'll just, just say on that, that interestingly, I, I talk, can this model be reproduced? Well, it hasn't been reproduced to date, but there are signs that by recent crane operator strikes in, in the city of Tianshui and other, other ports in, in, in China, um, that, that there is a narrative there, there is a memory there in which uh, uh, tower crane operators have have demanded better rep representation, have demanded higher wages, and are drawing on the same kind of uh, uh, demands, but also uh, a, a memory of what was happening at Yen Tien. So it's probably not directly reproducible because the, the political economy of China has changed very much since then. But nevertheless, I think it's still an important way of which if we want to build the power of port workers and the workers are generally, or support Chinese workers doing that, it's, it's an important example. Not least because it departs from the dominant view that you can't have effective representation in China, but is it better than nothing? And also, it, 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 it is a, a manifestation of, of, of working class power, which I think is important to all of us. So thank you for listening. Um. 
Thank you both for um, taking so many notes. Um, but I have a couple of questions for both of you. Um, Katie, I uh, have a question uh, specifically about European context, but it's also important other contexts where um, there's more and more talk of automation. Mm -hmm. What is the response to automation and what possibilities exist? Because it's often used as a way to, in fact, move people off the docks, mm -hmm. to, to move the workers. The second question I've got is, you mentioned um, the conditions of possibility for success, and they are, there's no violent reaction, there are alliances in the society, and then union democracy. I'm thinking about um, London Gateway and the way that it managed to secure, um, well, that, that Unite finally managed to secure, and the only way it was able to do so was through legal kind of means rather than, I mean, they had to take the, they had to take DPW, DP World to court in order mm. to be able to get the right to collective bargaining, although there had been lots of global struggles and solidarity, mm. um, a refusal to, you know, uh, unload and things like that. So I'm curious about to what extent do you take account of these legal mm -hmm. means of struggles? So those are my two questions for you. And then I have, um, Two questions for you, Tim. One, why did they not use coercion? I mean, what stopped them? Uh, or expulsion, because m you mentioned that some of those workers were migrants, I'm assuming from rural areas to, to there. And I'm, this, the circumstances under which you're describing this is very similar to the Arabian Peninsula, to the Gulf. And so I'm curious about why expulsion or deportability is not deployed. The second question is, what are the conditions under which a kind of a farce of a union or, or a, a, a carapace that is supposed to be state-led actually transforms. Is it push, push up from down below? Is it grassroots mobilization? Is it worker militancy that transforms this kind of a state union into uh, a real one or not? Because in the context of Bahrain, Kuwait and Aden, the British introduced trade unions precisely to act as this kind of a taming monster. And then in the end, at least for a period, those trade unions exceeded the expectations that they would be kind of liaisons and n n nice little conduits for managerial power. They ended up being actually forces for both workplace and political mobilization. So what accounts for, what under what conditions can such a thing emerge? Great, um, thanks for the questions. So um, the first question was on the issue of automation in the ports, which is definitely a hot topic these days. Um, personally, I think it's um, the attention being paid to it is a bit overblown relative to what is actually happening on the ground. As I'm sure you know, there are the vast majority of ports around the world do not have automated or semi-automated terminals. It's a very new thing in a few places. Um, nevertheless, for dock workers and their unions, they certainly, and particularly in places like Europe and the United States, they certainly perceive it as a major threat. And it is always a threat um, that employers kind of hold out as you know something on the horizon if they don't get the concessions that they want in bargaining. Um, but I think that that's that's the extent of it in most places at at this point. Um, but I think. For me, the way, the way I tend to think of automation is I, I think of it in more broadly in terms of what are the strategies available to capital in the port sector, right? Um, so one strategy that gets very little attention is uh, the strategy of relocation. So we often think about ports as immobile, that that's why dock workers have a lot of power. That's not the case at all. Port infra infrastructure um, is constantly on the move, and the UK is actually a very good example of that. So, you know, 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, London was a port city, right? We, we, nobody here, I, I, I would imagine, thinks of London as a port city, but it was a port city. And historically, dock workers were one of the most militant and well-organized groups of workers in, in London, um, and were kind of at the center of, of the trade union movement in London. Um, so why don't we have docks here anymore. Well, part of it has to do with the fact that the ships got bigger and, you know, were further up the Thames, but really it was primarily an employer strategy to, um, to take 
the infrastructure of capital out of the hands of these militant, well-organized workers in places like London. So to move um, downstream to Tilbury, um, out to Felixstowe. Now over time, those ports became organized as well, but that, that strategy of relocation, either re um, building new ports or gradually um, shifting infrastructure to other ports or cargo to other ports is a major, um, it's a major tool in, car in capital's arsenal in the sector. Um, technology over the long term, I mean, right now, yeah, we're seeing the threat of automation, if not much in practice, but, you know, um, beginning about six, 50 years ago, obviously, we saw containerization, major, major change in the sector um, that um, drastically reduced the, the workforce in many places. Um, but the point that I want to argue is that what I have seen in my research is that still, by far the most important tool in capital's Ar uh, arsenal in the, the port sector around the world is um, the state, <laughs> essentially. State repression, um, all, all of the means that um, capital has its, its disposal to either directly or indirectly use the state to um, discipline the workforce, um, I would argue is, is far and away the most, the most significant of these, um, of these strategies of capital. Um, as to the second question on DP World, so DP World, um, as you know, was was one of the cases in the um, in the project. I um, so my my take on what happened at DP World. This is actually in the dissertation. This is the kind of key case of where union democracy mattered, <laughs> because um, <coughs> essentially. The dock workers in the UK are um, members of the Unite the Union, which is um, you know, the largest union in the UK. It's a big multi-sectoral union. And um, <clears throat> they sort of concentrate organizing resources at the national level. So they have a national organizing department that runs organizing campaigns in all of the Unite sectors. And so the, the strategies they use were taken from SEIU, a service sector union in the United States. Um, and they, uh, the strategies that were developed for the service sector in the United States tend to focus on um, putting external pressure on companies, right? So targeting investors, key decision makers. And the reason for that is that in the service sector, it's often very difficult for workers to exercise power at the point of production because they have this sort of weak structural power, right? Um, now, my argument is that Unite um, essentially applied that same strategy that has, in many cases, been used to great effect in the service sector um, <clears throat> to this poor organizing campaign. And it didn't work because maritime employers, they don't care about their kind of external reputation. Reputational damage is not, um, it's not going to hurt their bottom line. What hurts their bottom line is workers' ability to slow down or stop the ships. And so they looked at um, these kind of unite, uh, this unite campaign where um, groups of, of uh, activists would go flyer outside um, DP World's corporate offices and they said, you know, why are we going to come to the table with you? Um, so I argue that what was supposed to be a, a sort of demonstration of strength in that case was actually a demonstration of weakness. And um, it's interesting, the, the issue of the lawsuit. Um, I have a kind of, I guess I have a slightly different take on that. Um, they, eventually Unite was actually able to organize, uh, to negotiate an access agreement with DP World as the result, um, because Spanish dock workers at the port of um, Algeciras uh, threatened to stop the first ship that was loaded at DP World. They got this access agreement, but they hadn't, um, this sort of national organizing department of Unite hadn't built a union committee uh, on the shop floor prior to that point. So they kind of came in and were easily painted as outsiders by the company because they hadn't built relationships with the workers. They were there for six months and they weren't able to meet the 10% threshold to go into bargaining, which is a very low threshold to meet, right? So it was only when, um, uh, workers, dock workers in the port, many of whom had come from the port of Tilbury, which is quite a strong union port. Um, they, they had had previous experience um, as trade union activists and, and happened to be working at DP World. It wasn't until they started getting involved and um, kind of organizing their colleagues at the shop floor that, that um, 
things really took off. So, so I'm not I'm I'm not really sure what to say about the role of the lawsuit, but that that's kind of my take overall on the DP World organizing. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, just to re re refresh the questions. Thank you, Lale. Um, uh, one is uh, the first question is why didn't the state use coercion? Why didn't it use force? It, it, you know, it's it's a very common occurrence in China that response to, to labor militancy is to is to deploy to deploy force. I think I think the first thing to look at it really, and again this echoes Katie's point on on how important the state is, is that the state was increasingly concerned about inequalities that were emerging both geographic sectoral level, at a class level, at a gender level, at all levels that were emerging in Chinese society as a result of 25 years, 30 years of, of, of basically neo, uh, moderated neoliberal reforms. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the ways that the state adapted, uh, that, that, uh, that deployed to reduce those, to attempt to reduce that, one of many ways, one of many levers it used, uh, was to allow, was to to tolerate rather a certain degree of labour militancy, and 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 you know my research shows quite quite clearly, not in this paper but in other papers, that there were there were clear benchmarks of how far you could go as a, as, as, as workers. If you block, if you strike in the factory and keep it to the factory or the port, and they say the state, the the, the the armed forces of coercion, will leave you alone. They won't intervene. If you if you march around the factory estate and, and, and make up make links with other factories, the police will arrive, but they probably still will, I'm generalizing here, but they generally won't intervene. If you march out of the factory district or the port district, or increasingly the city center with a Walmart organizing in China, then and start blocking roads, the state will push you around. The forces of coercion will push you around, they'll take out your leaders, um, and uh, and they 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 will will use will use significant threats to get you off the main off those roads. If you block a railway, you're in prison. Simple as that. They'll come in very very hard. So there there are, there are there are different levels. That it is, and it's quite clear to certainly some of those experienced labor NGO organizers and organizations that I was talking about earlier mentioned earlier on that there were that you know there, particularly up until about twenty between the years of 2007 to 2014, the time period of this research, um, that the state was moving from concession to, uh, from repression to concession, which didn't exclude con repression. And, and one of the levers that used to, to reduce the, the inequality that it was very worried about was, was to tolerate degrees of, of unrest. Another reason why they didn't intervene is that tower and gantry train, crane operators, although it's not a highly skilled job, it is a skilled job. It's not something that you can learn a day. It's not like being a lecturer. You, got, you, know, you can learn that in a day. But, but um, it's a joke, guys. It's a joke. Uh, <laughs> but but this, this is a job that, that you do need. Uh, you, you, it's not easy to bring, you know, it's not easy to bring in new workers. And, and also there was a certain amount of, as I've said, not wanting to romanticize, uh, there was low turnover. So uh, there was uh, a cohesiveness about, about the, the, work, the, the working work, workforce at Yentian. Th thirdly, as well, that Yen Tian emerged out, as I said earlier, of a wave of dot workers disputes around, not just in Guangdong in mainland China, but in, very interestingly in, in Hong Kong as well. In 2012, there was an unprecedented, not unprecedented, if we go back <coughs> to 1926, I think, but there was a, a, a very powerful and very important strike by Hong Kong dot workers across four or five outsourced firms that supplied workers, that, that supplied workers to, to the dots, crane operators, gantry, crane, gantry and crane, uh, tower crane operators. It, 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 it was a fascinating strike. It, it achieved massive public support, which is unusual in Hong Kong. Um, it went on for three weeks. There were there were occupations and tent cities by the by the ports itself. There were millions of, of Hong Kong dollars raised in support of the strike. Um, it won fuck all, more or less. I know that sounds very very uh, very very negative, but. Uh, out of that strike, it's very interesting, out of that strike where there is freedom of association in Hong Kong, uh, mainly because for the same reasons the British introduced it elsewhere, um, uh, the Hong Kong Dot Workers Union did, 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 did build it, did attract members, uh, up to 700, I think, after the strike. That's now down to crisis levels. In fact, I'm interview interviewing the, 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 some of the activists in that union next week in Hong Kong. So, so and, and no collective bargaining agreement was reached. 
and uh, no, uh, it was pretty much a, a, a very shoddy compromise, shall we say, if not an outright defeat. Very different outcome to what was happening in China, where annual collective bargaining was institutionalized, or in mainland China, where it was institutionalized. So I think that one of, one of the reasons that, 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 that the Chinese authorities didn't use coercion is maybe uh, is, is because it was part of a wave of strikes, and also coercion and this goes into political science, really, but, but coercion in an authoritarian state can have very different implications to, say, a semi-authoritarian state, such as Hong Kong, or a post-colonial state, I, I, I think, anyway. Um, on the issue of what does it take to transform a party-led organization like the All China Federation of Trade Unions? Well, the, the stock Marxist reply is, of course, the action of the working class, the liberation of the working class, the action of the working class. Great, we all agree with that, I assume. Um, and, and indeed, it is pressure, I would argue, and have argued many times, that it is that class struggle from below that will generate, um, I don't say a, ref a, 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 a transformation of that party-led trade union, but will force it to act. A bit like trade union bureaucrats in this country, in many ways. They tend to, tend to be far happier behind the desk, but if we, if we organize and force them to action, they will, they will take, take action. But in China as well, because because of the state's narrative around stability and, and around legitimacy, the more unrest that takes place, the more class struggle there is, then the union will come under pressure from its masters in the union, in, in the party, from above. We'll say, why aren't, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing more to curb this unrest? Why are we faced with these ongoing strikes? So the party, will, so the union is trapped in the middle that it's facing from, from pressure from below and pressure from above. And even under Xi Jinping, who has this no, no, deserved reputation for being a, a very different shade of authoritarian uh, ruler than, than, than the previous regime that came before him, nevertheless has demanded that the ACFTU come up with blueprints for, for reform. So I, I, I think that, that, that what does it take to transform a party-led union? Um, uh, at the end of the day, it will be the, the emergence, I think, of independent or, or non-party affiliated trade unions out of that working class struggle. I think that is the key issue, which, which you know, bourgeois institutions like the ILO like to phrase around the notion of freedom, very important notion of freedom of association. But, uh, but, uh, but at, the same, at, at, the, at the same time, I, I think even then, if we look at the experience of Russia and if we look at the experience of other, other uh, Indonesia, um, uh, Poland, the emergence of independent trade unions do, or alternative trade unions in the Russian context does not mean that those old traditional party-led Stalinist, if you like, trade union models go away. They don't go away at all. So, so I think that the reform of these party beasts is, is important, is important to the overall class struggle, definitely. That's definitely actually applicable to Egypt, as for example. Yeah, yeah Egypt's another great example. Well. Great, thank you. Um, any questions? Yes, please. With respect to, um, you know, uh, the One Belt, One Road, uh, it had Gawadar port in Pakistan and a similar uh, port in Djibouti. So you mentioned the Hong Kong workers strike. I mean, and from Katie's point, is there a, is there a possibility of trade unions within the, within the region, for example? Um, I mean, we went to a very interesting um, talk on China's political economy uh, a couple of uh, 
uh, well, a couple of days ago. And I, I, what I, this question is about imperialism and what we understand by China's expansion. The so first question, just so that we can record this, was for Katie to talk about the exclusiveness of dockers and the workers' role in that. So, Katie, please. I'm not sure I entirely understood the question. Could you say a bit more what you mean by exclusiveness? Okay. Um, yeah, so I um, I think that dock workers, in, in some ways, their position is unique. Um, but I don't I don't take a sort of um, really old school Marxist view about the sort of centrality of workers at the commanding heights of the economy and heavy industry. That's not my that wouldn't be the way that I would think about strate um, strategic workers. I think um, Certainly, workers in these um, key nodal points in networks of circulation, like dock workers, like other transportation workers, those are st strategic workers. Um, workers in heavy manufacturing, yes, they, they're strategic workers. But I think, um, you know, bringing in, for example, Marxist feminist theory and you know social reproduction theory, um, you know, education workers are strategic workers, healthcare workers are strategic workers. So I, I do think. Um, I, I do think that one of the problems that I that I find again and again with studying this sector is there's a real tendency, um, particularly in the Marxist left, to really romanticize um, dock workers, miners, uh, factory workers, and um, I think that can be qu quite problematic. Um, I think that you know really thinking about um, what it means to develop effective working class strategy today will necessitate kind of going beyond that. Um, and in terms of um, this, the kind of second part of the question that you asked about the labor conditions um, of dock workers, they really vary tremendously, um, both within ports and across ports. So um, it's interesting that in, in Tim's case, the kind of the group of workers that sort of started off organizing were the cra crane operators um, who are, I think it's fair to say, always in, in ports up, uh, among the most powerful group of workers. They're highly skilled. Um, they have scarce skills. So um, becoming a crane operator involves a lot of training, and you're operating incredibly valuable equipment from the perspective of, of capital. Um, you know, and, and that runs in a spectrum all the way to you know, casualized day laborers who um, you know, can be um, totally unskilled in, in the sense of having particular training to do the job. Um, and certainly when you look at the kind of global north, global south divide, the proportion of workers in that second category in the global south is much higher. So, um, you know, when I visited the Port of Buenaventura in Colombia, um, workers uh, literally were sort of sleeping on the in the streets outside of the terminals hoping to get day work, working completely without any kind of uh, protective equipment, wearing flip-flops, working at height. Um, you know, and if you go to visit the port of Felixstowe here in the UK, I mean, the, the, the kind of picture you get couldn't be more different. So basically, huge range. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Uh, th thanks, for, thanks for that, I have to say, very complicated question, really. I think, uh, so, so I'm going to divide it into two and then, and then make a, 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 a brief sally uh, attempt at bringing it together, which I will no doubt fail at. But, uh, so One Belt, you mentioned One Belt, One, one Road uh, and the uh, internationaliz internationalization of, of Chinese capital and the Chinese economy. Yes, as all we know, it's happening. And there is uh, an interesting and very lively uh, debate around that over whether the 
uh, the, it's all true, true, the, the, the expansion of Chinese capital beyond its borders into, into other developing countries, into the South countries, is a rerun of Western imperialism or Western style imperialism. Well, of course, that's nonsense. Well, I would argue that it's absolute nonsense that it, that it is not, that it's not the case in China. And even those, uh, even those uh, uh, commentators who, who've tried to argue that China is exporting its own very authoritarian notion of labor relations, say, to copper mines in Zambia, to soya plantations in Brazil, the, 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 the real, the good research on the ground has, has found that is not the case. Doesn't mean that there's no exploitation, doesn't mean um, that, uh, uh, that, 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 that Chinese, uh, Chinese capital is, is somehow less, more benign, of, of course not. Chinese capital behaves as it does, not because it's Chinese, but because it's capital. And uh, I have had some very tense and very interesting arguments with African trade unionists uh, over that issue, where there is a very racialized notion, in, in certainly in, 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 the, in the Gambia, in Ghana, and, uh, and uh, Zambia, the, the, and, and Ethiopia, around, around Chinese capital there, which, uh, which I think is prob problematic. Um, uh, Nevertheless, it's a really, I think it's a really important and interesting debate, particularly as One Belt, One Road expands. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a top-down uh, state expansion uh, to, 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 uh, to develop infrastructure and, and, and trade deals along which Chinese capital can spread um, and, and find new markets. Um, on, on out of that inter internationalization, are there opportunities for our side for workers to link up to to make those connections, and you, you raise a, uh, you know, uh, what was a, a hot topic certainly in in labour and trade union circles in in Hong Kong in 2012 and in 2013, the Hong Kong dot worker strike and the Yen Tien strike, which was only about 40, 50 miles apart, anyway, albeit uh, you know separated by a year's time. Um, no, is a simple answer. I think that the the uh, the possibilities of that are contained not just by are constrained rather they're not impossible but they're not just constrained by the national context that Katie's emphasised is so important but I think they're also constrained by the uh, probably by the historically very weak position that that global union federation GUFs and, 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 and the international trade union movement finds itself in. Which isn't to say there aren't nodes of strength, nodes of expression of structural and associational power, there aren't great victories. Um, but nevertheless, if we look at the bigger picture, despite Beverly Silver's optimism, we're, we're in a pretty we're in a pretty pretty dim place at, at, at the moment. So it's it, it a constraint. So that that kind of linking up or that that kind of solidarity going beyond borders is 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 constrained not just by by expressions of authoritarianism, but also by the, the weakness by, by 35, 40 years of neoliberal attacks on the very notion of associational working class power. So I, I, I think not that that can't change if we look at and, and to put some empirical meat on that kind of abstract notion there is, is that if you look at, say, um, uh, framework agreements, um, I don't know, I, IKEA is very keen on framework agreements, and, uh, and, and these, these are collective bargaining associations that go beyond borders at a regional level and even an international level. Um, China, the Chinese state will have no truck with them. The ACFTU will have no truck with them. So it's quite happy to attend meetings with the IUF, uh, the International Union of Food, the, the Chemical Workers Union, Dock Workers Unions. It will quite happy to attend conferences like that. But the notion of forming any kind of uh, uh, linking up or any kind of solidarity network is is not on the cards beyond you know having a chat and a pint together really. So in, in, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm quite pessimistic about that. Can I cut it? Oh, no, go on ahead. I was going to, I was just going to ask if I could add to that because my, my project is actually primarily about labor internationalism among dock workers. And um, I don't look at China, but um, directly, but it comes up a lot. <laughs> so the fact that Chinese workers aren't part of these international networks is a problem for workers elsewhere. It's not just a problem for Chinese workers. Um, and I think that's really important to emphasize. One of the cases in my dissertation um, looks at the privatization of the port of Piraeus in Greece, um, which uh, the Troika essentially forced the Greek state to privatize as part of its um, uh, loan repayment package. And the port was, um, the, the top bidder 
uh, the only really serious bidder was Costco, the Chinese state-owned shipping company, right? And in fact, um, China is, um, well, part, you know, part of the, the kind of processes that you gestured toward, the, the, you know, investments in infrastructure in many places around the world. But China has seen um, the port of Piraeus as a key entry point to the European market, right? It's the first major European port in the Eastern Mediterranean, just out of the, um, the, uh, the canal. So it's, um, and, and they're investing not just in the port, but in the kind of transportation infrastructure around the port to connect it to central um, European markets. And so um, Greek dock workers, you know, are heavily involved in these international networks. But what would have been really effective for them during their dispute is if they had been able to receive solidarity from Chinese dock workers, right? And that's obviously not forthcoming. And, and so that's, it's this sort of major hole in global unionism in general because of the outsized role of China in the global economy. So, yeah. Please. I, I, can't, I can't resist build, building on that a little <laughs> bit because, because this union about, this argument about, about trade union reform within China and the notion of, you know, what, what do we do we organize, do, do Chinese workers organize underground, take all those risks, or do they try and, you know, there's, there's a world of difference between, you know, an edict from Xi Jinping saying to the ACFD, you've got to reform, you've got to do better, do a better job at, at heading off industrial unrest, and a bunch of workers banging on the door of the enterprise level trade union chair and saying, we want a pay rise and we want you to act more effectively. I think there's a world of, world of, world of difference between those two expressions of power. Um, so, but this reform, th this argument, this debate over trade union reform in China has its, has its ripples, to use Casey's word again, outside the movement, in the international labor movement. And there is that gap, there is that, that you know, massive gap where Chinese workers are constrained from effect, uh, of providing, uh, of taking part in solidarity actions, both at an institutional level and, a, and at a local re repressive level as well. And this becomes even more interesting when you should, should apparently independent trade unions engage with the ACFCU on its international in its international work, it is very active on the international front. It has a position on the ILO Workers Committee. Many many unions object to that. Many other unions support it. It's a, it's a very important and a very interesting ar argument. As Katie will know more about one side of this than I do, but, but as dock workers have 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 new new dock worker unions, international unions have emerged in recent years, challenging the International Transport Federations monopoly over international organizing on the docks. Um, at the same time, I recently, you know, I'm, I've been asked to give this, this presentation to the International Fed Transport Federation around. And also at the same time, it's told me that they have just started a exchange program with who? The All China Federation of Trade Unions, which they hadn't hitherto done to. So, so this debate becomes very, very in, I thought you'd write that down. <laughs> <laughs> it's being filmed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it becomes very, very important. So very, you know, it's not, it's not just about Yen Tian. It's not just, you know, as you said, it's not just about Chinese workers. There is a, there is a gap there. And, 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 you know, I would argue the way to fill it is, is, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's the ACFTU, well, it does matter, but it's not just about forcing the ACFTU into taking taking a more progressive stance. It's about the exercise and of, of class power in at the point of production. I know it's a cliche, but, but I think it always comes back to that. Right, thank you. Uh, Rafif, yes. and, then, uh, and then you, and then Adam. Uh, thank you both for your excellent presentations. Casey, I really appreciate you taking on the massive storage problem. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right about that. Although I think it comes from a good place of and a bit of a desperation about wanting something to really work and seeing this as a strategic sector, um, which I, I tend to take. Um, when you were speaking about the blank sector, that really reminded me of Alan Turing's point of sector with the sun, and mm -hmm. also what Sylvie Lane's doing, and how it wasn't just a strike, but everything around it, the pubs and the meetings and the families and all the organizing. So I was wondering if you could give us a few examples of, of when that worked and how it was effective. Mm -hmm. um, my second question is a bit bigger conceptually, and I'm sorry if I'm being asked this to sound like I'm failing. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I, when I first started doing this work, I completely had this conception of core periphery. Um, but when you look at it, it's a much more complicated narrative mm -hmm. how these relations are worked. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese in the shape of Korea, GC World in England, um, when you speak to the main interview people in GC, you realize well, these are all old ports where these works were going to take mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the south-south relations, but also south-north. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
So it, but also debt, for example, the way that the Chinese, this is a question I really want to know, is, is the, the Chinese lend money and then in the payback for the debt, they've taken, for example, a 99-year concession on a port in Colombo or established military bases alongside, which is an old school imperialist thing, is to, to take their military bases and commercial bases next to each other. So exactly. how is that different? Well yeah. GP World has done that in Africa where they take yeah. a military base that puts on the port right next to it. So mm -hmm. as how do you, if, if I'm fine, I don't mean to call it imperialist, that's totally fine, but mm -hmm. how do you want to pluralize that? Is it just internationalization of capital? Or is there actually more complex story of imperialism now that is just not visible to us? Mm. Yeah, let's quite co collect all the questions and then the gentleman in the back. Association of power, yeah. But they're both, both active. <laughs> <laughs> so if you start from that angle and you're thinking like, oh, how do we provide these kind of communities and uh, innovation and uh, cause that has to kind of uh, what do we do? So then it will be a more complex system for them. Mm. And then the second point is more sort of like the presentation is about uh, what is the right way for us to evaluate the capacity that they have to pay to adapt <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it a good thing that uh, they are sort of breaking out their own model or they still have to pay fees? Like what is matters in it? And is it like five, ten years out before we saw something like that again? Because it's a good capitalist state that can adapt to anything. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one way. Mm. Adam? Yeah, my question actually follows on Max from that around um, this idea of association of power. Um, so I, I had a bit of a problem with this, not in the sense that I think obviously it's important to have an uh, linkages with with communities and, and et cetera, but it seems to me it, it, it leaves out the actual another factor, which is the kind of subjective um, presence of militants um, or a political vehicle, political organization, mm -hmm. whether it be at, in the workplace or out in the wider um, area. Mm -hmm. so that it's not just a matter of workers organizing and having linkage, okay. it's also a matter of there being um, some kind of political uh, vehicle and memory of the, of the struggles and, and class consciousness that can actually imbue, um, imbue these strikes. And I think that partly explains this variation um, across different places, even within countries that have changed mm. and within branch units. Yeah, yeah. branch units, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Katie, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, so thank you for the questions. And actually, all three of your questions, I'm going to kind of roll into one because I think they actually they fit together really nicely. Um, <laughs> I figured. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll just, I'll, I'll actually kind of work backward from Adam's question um, on associational power um, and the role of political militants um, in these processes. And then link that with the, the question of, so how do you build associational power and how does that link up with this question of the flank pr protecting the fortress? So in both of the successful cases um, in, in my dissertation, which I alluded to several times, in Chile and Portugal, um, political militants from small far left political parties were, uh, played an incredibly important role. So, um, and I'm, I'll, I'll explain the Chilean case because it's a, it was a national strike and it has a lot of um, uh, kind of really interesting facets. So Chile, um, obviously a country in the global south, um, in terms of the kind of contrast to what, what Tim's talked about with China, with Colombia, with many other countries in the global south, it's, it's very much on the kind of end of the spectrum where there's a lot more uh, freedom of association, um, much lower levels of, of um, state violence and other forms of violence in the society. So a, a relatively more, um, 
you know, propitious playing field for labor to organize in. Um, Chile had a long um, dictatorship under Augusto Pinochet for 17 years, um, but prior to that was um, really for most of the 20th century had the strongest sort of uh, organized left within Latin America. And it was a um, very um, heterogeneous left. There was the, the sort of Moscow-aligned Communist Party. There was a non-aligned Socialist Party. There was always a strong um, anarchist um, presence, um, uh, you know, armed groups. So a, a very broad left with lots of, uh, of different tendencies. And despite this dictatorship, this left-wing um, tradition still has very strong roots in the society. And although the, um, the sort of legacy or the transmission of this historical memory was broken to some degree um, by disappearances of trade union activists and political militants during the dictatorship, the, the kind of roots stretching back to the 60s and 70s in particular are still very much in evidence. And so the, many of the dock worker union activists and leaders in Chile either themselves were involved in um, these militant groups in the 60s and 70s in um, underground organizations um, fighting the dictatorship in the 70s and 80s, or for those who are like my, my age and younger, come from families like that. Um, and uh, overall, at kind of nationally, many of the activists within this um, union are members of a small far left group called the Izquierda Libertaria, which is a sort of um, left communist or anarchist grouping, depending on who you ask and what day you ask. Um, but they, this grouping um, provided a, a very effective national network for the dock workers. And they're not, a, um, they didn't have a parliamentary presence, um, but they have very strong roots in the student movement, the university student movement in particular. University students played uh, key roles in the national strikes of the dock workers, provided them with linkages to the teachers unions, to miners unions, to uh, forestry workers, um, and others. And they, uh, this very poorly resourced union had essentially a full-time historian, a full-time economist, a full-time labor lawyer working for them either for free or for almost nothing. Um, they had university students leaving school for a while to go work on the docks to participate in the strikes. And, um, you know, and the union leadership themselves were incredibly savvy uh, coming out of these long-term histories of struggle. So um, I, I think that that is a, re a super important dimension. It's really, um, I, I think it's unfortunate that it's so often left out of these stories. There's an excellent um, <coughs> article that was just out in the latest, um, issue of Work, Employment, and Society by a, a guy named Omar Monkey, who actually is a student of Eli Friedman's at Cornell, um, who's just written a piece on um, miners' unions in Chile and makes e exactly the same point. So, you know, not just bringing the political back in, in in the sense of analyzing the role of the state, but bringing the political back in in terms of um, its role in organizing um, uh, worker struggles as well. and. Um, and this is particularly important in places where um, workers are so constrained in what they're able to do. You know, this question that you posed of how do you build associational power in the first place? Well, in many places, you know, just trying to do that at the point of production is, you're not, it's not going to be effective. You're just going to be crushed. You have to build these kind of, these broader layers of support outside um, to provide something of a buffer. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but um, and again, in the Portuguese case, very similar. And if you look at, um, you know, historically, some of the most powerful dock worker unions, like the ILWU on the West Coast in the United States, the, the San Francisco General Strike in 1934, the Communist Party played an incredibly important mediating role, um, bringing in students and unemployed workers. Um, you know, the London Dock Strike, which was the first general strike in the UK at the end of the 19th century. So. Um, I think that this is a pattern that crops up again and again, and I completely agree with you that it's underdeveloped um, theoretically, and that, um, and uh, Rafif, to speak to your point, that part of what this, this broader political organizing does is to bring in large groups of people who are considered non-strategic in terms of their economic role, but actually um, without whom these strategic workers would simply be crushed. They need this sort of buffer of civil society to be able to kind of um, break out of 
um, powerlessness. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, wow, yeah, okay, so um, I was processing what you were saying there as well, Katie, but um, yeah, so do we need a more complex notion or theor theorizing uh, around imperialism? Yes. Am I going to do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, let me, con let me contextualize that, that answer a, a, a little bit as, uh, as well. Is because I, I guess my, my reaction earlier on uh, around to, to some of the stuff that we are fed about the nature of Chinese investment in and Chinese aid or Chinese uh, or Belt and Road in, in other southern countries is, you know, on the one hand, you, we will see in the Financial Times or, or the Times rather that, that it's actually a rerun of the scramble for mm -hmm. Africa. On the other hand, we'll, we'll see it uh, as, a, um, as a form of profound and extreme exploitation that the Chinese are, are exporting. And again, these arguments are then reproduced and repeated uh, 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 um, um, among trade unionists, among labour activists, in, in those notions. So I'm, I guess I'm I'm, I'm reacting, overreacting mm -hmm. to, to that to that really. Um, simply on, on on the grounds that I, I think that if we look, and and it's not just a, uh, it, it, it's a reaction that I think is is is, is informed by. That if we look at um, the difference between. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese Ch Chinese investment and Chinese aid in, in say, let's take uh, Angola and Ethiopia, does not reproduce the conditionalities that neoliberal aid has, 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 has generated and structural adjustment policies have generated in, or the same type of, of, of outcomes that, that, that Western investment have, which isn't to say it's not exploitative, which isn't to say that it is not another form of imperialism. Um, or requires a new form of imperialism. I, I was over at an end, but 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 it is, but it but it is not the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Does it, yeah. So, um, and and uh, just just to put it, uh, as we speak right now, there are three major. There are protests in three, or a, a special economic zone in Vietnam, a city in Vietnam, and uh, um, two major Chinese owned factories in Vietnam against an, a, a new law that is uh, in Vietnam that is allowing special economic zones to be bought up for 99 years um, in Vietnam and in which Chinese investment, uh, Chinese investors are showing great interest in and, and the Vietnamese are saying this is the takeover of, 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 of Vietnam by China. So, so it's really important uh, how to theorize it, I think, you know, help <laughs> um, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the notion of, it, does China, uh, are we being too optimistic about China? I, I think I think it's a really interesting question. Um, having spent six years working for a, a labour NGO based in Hong Kong, uh, where my main job was to plough through mainland reports of labour unrest, industrial accidents, labour protests in mainland China, um, and it was profoundly depressing during from 1996 to 2002. I did that. And, and it was it was very because it was it was a horror story. It was w like watching a horror story, uh, in, uh, you know, evolve from from a safe distance. It didn't affect me not directly, but you know, for six yeah I think yeah for six years. And you know you you you'd look at you know Guangzhou uh, Bao, you'd look at Workers Daily, you'd look at uh, the Guangzhou Evening Post, you look at Nanfang Daily or the Southern Daily, and where there is a tr there was and is a tradition of investigative reporting in mainland China that that there's. Really acknowledging they were, you know, we had great reporters reporting on this stuff and trying to bring it to light, and it did produce, uh, did produce changes. But it was, you know, for, uh, um, you know, there was no cause for optimism. You know, at one point in 2002, the best place to go in the world to get a limb shown sewn back on was Shenzhen in South China. Why? Because every 30 minutes in Shenzhen in 1999, somebody lost a limb. Every 30 minutes, that would be a leg or a finger. Uh, an arm or something, and so there was, uh, there was a cottage or a major industry that grew up around that, around getting those limbs sewn back up. So this was using the, a horror story was was is, is not. So I'm painting this very bleak picture to show to demonstrate that when the tide began to turn, when we had the labour contract law in 2008, it came out of labour unrest, and we had a, a shift away from blanket repression. When we had the state beginning to discipline capital, it, it was a great time. It was you know and and you know you you it was you know. The, you know, our side were winning, well, not winning, but they were making a difference. And it was a very exciting time to be involved in that, particularly in contrast to what came before it, what preceded, and, and the horror show that preceded a predatory capital there. So, I'll, uh, you know, I, and, and, and I think some of us, probably me included, did go a bit too far, particularly when we see 
recent events and, and, and the clampdown that we've seen on feminists, on human rights lawyers, on labour activists, on civil society in general. Which kind of takes me to Adam's point about associational power. And I, I couldn't agree with you more, Adam, if we get fixated on associational power at the point of production um, uh, and, and ignore the fact that political agency, political organisations, uh, civil society plays a role, then, then, then I, I think this is... is you know, then we are a lot. Then, then we're not really going to go anywhere, really, in in terms of uh, generating a lay a labour or, or, or a social movement. And indeed, the the, the working class militancy and the nascent labour movement that evolved in Guangdong, say that you know up until quite recently, was very much informed. Was very much a part of of, of the operations of particularly Hong Kong registered NGO, labour NGOs operative in Guangdong. Who, who, who pushed collective bargaining, who pushed, beget, began to get directly involved in strike organizing, began to take significant risks. So, so yeah, that, 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 is, that is important. Nevertheless, I think on, on the other side is, you know, those dot workers in the NTN, they weren't assisted by civil society. None of them ever went to a labor NGO. One of the, they, they did go to a labor lawyer who, were, who, who was famous for, for, his, for his labor law work. But civil society wasn't particularly directly involved in that. So it was an expression of associational power that was duly tamed. Now, whether it would have been sustained by a wider involvement of civil society, I think in the context of China, no, because of that authoritarian nature. But in the wider context of labor organizing, I would say yes. So I know that's a kind of a bit of a fudge, uh, but I think we do have to recognize that, that point power at the point of production Structural power can produce mm -hmm. material gains that don't necessarily involve the plant workers. Mm -hmm. It's a point of view. Um, thank you so much, both of you. It, um, this has been particularly useful for me because I'm writing the chapter right now, which starts with a strike in Aden in 1948, the one that Thanos talked about. And so it's, this is incredibly useful and very good for me to actually think with. Thank you so much.